Hello, I'm Michael Rickards, I'm Executive Director of the Whole Institute of Public Policy, and this is our forum. Uh, today, our guest is Jennifer Valverde, who's a professor of law at Rutgers the State University and also involved with the Special Education Clinic. Those of you who are aware, we are doing a major study of the question of the disabled on October 3rd. And please look at our website so you can get more information about what appears to be a major event that we're taking place first at the state and hopefully across the nation. Jennifer, welcome. We're delighted to have you here this morning. Thank you for having me here. Now, you've been involved at, uh, at Rutgers in this whole question of special education. Give me the definition, um, a rough definition of special education. Well, special education are support services and programming that's available to students who are found to have a disability. But the key in the definition is that the disability has to affect the student's ability to learn. So it's not sufficient that a student simply has a disability in order to be eligible, but the disability actually has to adversely affect learning. So it's an educational definition Absolutely. of disability. Yes. Good. Um, how, many, how many students do you think this clinic has served since you've been there? I've been there uh, going on 10 years, um, and I would say on average we handle about 35 cases per year. Um, so my math isn't so good. 350 <laughs> students, I, I would say. So you don't really deal with students, though. You train the lawyers who, in terms, deal with the clients. Right. So, so we have a threefold mission in the clinic. We um, provide free legal services to low-income parents of children with disabilities in special education cases. And then we train law students to represent those clients in that area of the law. So the law students, in essence, are acting as the attorneys in these cases, but they're acting under our supervision. What, well, what would the coursework be like that you're giving these lawyers to kind of bone up on? on uh, was a special ed law? We, uh, all of the students have to take a seminar in special education law. Um, it's a one semester seminar and they can either take it while they're taking the clinic or as a prereq. And, um, and while they're in the clinic, they're uh, being educated in lawyering skills. So everything from interviewing and counseling clients, negotiation to trial advocacy skills. If you, if in fact you look back on the law that was passed, what would you say is some of the biggest problems that came out of the law that we haven't dealt with? Well, if you compare versions of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the 2004 version with the 1997 predecessor, I think we actually lost some ground in terms of um, the, the rights available to parents. Uh, and then I think subsequent case law has also whittled away some of those rights. For example, things like um, the, the Schaefer decision, putting the burden of proof um, back on parents, the um, Arlington decision, not allowing expert fees to be recouped in special education cases. All of it has made it more difficult for parents to advocate on behalf of their children. Why, why is there a rollback? Is it because special ed has become so terribly expensive that courts and even the legislature has rolled it back a bit? I think that has a lot to do with it. And then when you, um, you know, if you look at the state of New Jersey itself, when the school districts are bearing the brunt of the, the special education funding, so the local towns and cities, um, it is a huge cost. And I think there's a lot of fighting that goes back and forth between whether or not that money should be dedicated towards regular ed and perhaps gifted and talented programs versus special education programming for students. You have said that one of the problems in dealing with the question of special, special education is really the, the unequal reach of the law, especially in districts that are not so poor as to qualify at Abbott, but not so rich as to be able to do whatever they wanted the great middle range. How did that happen? Well, I think if you look at the federal law itself um, and you have pages of the law that speak to things like reimbursement for parents who unilaterally place their children in private schools, so that's a wonderful remedy that they have when they have the money to pay out for services. 
and you know the one liner you know or no liners about what's available to to students who can't pay out whose families cannot afford that so the only remedy that that those students whose families cannot um, pay out for those services when there's a dispute is they can get compensatory education and compensatory education is is a helpful remedy when perhaps the deprivation of education was maybe a year or less but when you see the cases that we see um, and they're far too common I think where you have six seven even ten years of educational deprivation where students were classified um, as eligible for special education and yet year after year did not get the services they should have received, there is no remedy. Compensatory education is, is not an adequate remedy for those children um, later in life. I'm told that the state of New Jersey has the best special education in the country, that people, are, that people come in to live in the state because of the services that we provide for their kids, very expensive services. I had three women on who talked about autism. Mm -hmm. They were very clear about that, that they had come, some of them had come into New Jersey just to use the services. Do we have the best special ed laws in the Republic? We have some very good special education laws and regulations. Um, you know, I think we do provide a lot of additional protections for parents that are necessary to provide for parents compared to other states, although some states still provide additional protections um, than we do. California is one example. Um, I think, again, I can only speak within the context of the cases that we have and the communities that we work regularly with. Um, what happens is that the laws are not being fully implemented. And so if we could ensure that they were being fully implemented for every child. I think we would do quite well as a state. I think that, um, you know, studies have shown that where uh, parents have legal representation in special education cases and they have a dispute with the school district, they, it's, it's pretty equal as to who wins. 50% of the time they will win. When parents do not have legal representation in those cases, a study came out in 2004, 2005, um, that found that only 15% of those parents win. So I think, again, it comes down to money and, and the economic situation in terms of how the programs are provided and also how easily parents can go after school districts to make sure that the children are getting what they need. Who is shrinking people's rights? Is it the, the school district? The administrators at the school level? I don't want to blame the administrators at the school level. I think that a lot of time it has to do with numbers and budget crunching, particularly in this day and age. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of pulling students back in district for less efficient programming, whereas they once maybe were paid for to go outside of the school district and get private programming. Um, and I think that the school districts, uh, some of them do an excellent job, going back to your autism example, of educating students in the district. For example, Princeton does a fabulous job with students with autism. They learned a lot from the Eden Institute down there and they implemented a lot of that within their own public school system. Then you have other school districts where they're pulling students willy-nilly back into district thinking that they'll just give them what they have, but it's not sufficient. And and I think a lot of it's economic driven, economically driven, but I also think sometimes the economics are blamed for it and perhaps it's, you know, not necessarily all economics. We've, we're in a situation in some cases where these school districts are pulling the kids out of private school because they can't afford a hundred. 125,000 a year as opposed to 14. Um, and I assume that when that happens, that there really is probably a loss of services. But does special education even work? It's a very good question. Um, and I think that's one of the difficulties with special education. There has yet to be any sort of a longitudinal study that looks at whether or not the programming that is provided has a beneficial effect. Uh, certain types of services have been studied. For example, take the Wilson Reading Program, which is commonly used for students with reading disabilities. Right. Um, that has been studied, tried and true method, and, and proven that it works. But for many of the other issues that, that children with disabilities face, there has been no controlled studies. And I think 
in large part, that's because it's hard to control for all the variables. It's not just what's provided, it's the quality of the teacher, it's the quality of the service providers, it's the follow through at home. I think all of those things also play into it. And, and in large part, that's why perhaps nobody has undertaken that sort of a study. But when we're investing all of this money in special education, I think somebody at some point needs to start looking at really, okay, what is working? And, and then we can replicate that. Because we don't even know what works in regular schools with so-called regular children, how they learn math, how they learn English, how they learn social studies, we are still talking about no child left behind and we're not even sure what we're not leaving them behind to do. Uh, and I wonder where it's more complicated in special ed where you have a mix of, of not just pedagogical problems but neurological and, and everything else that you can think of economic if in fact we've even come close to doing that who who's doing the best research on the efficacy of special ed are there some scholars that you would point to for example i would, would point to uh, um, linda darlin at stanford linda hammond darlin at stanford for her work or diane ravitch and uh, her work mm -hmm. on, on public ed but is there somebody is there some major figures that are doing great work on looking at the efficacy of special ed? I don't think, as far as I know, I don't know of any great names who, of, of folks who are doing that type of research. Again, I think it's been much more disability focused, so broken down into the various disabling categories. Mm -hmm. And so there's research that's being done on autism, there's research that's being done on certain types of reading disabilities, things like that. But special education overall, I don't think it's happening. Um, and, and again, I come back to, you know, each child is unique. So I think it's very hard to, to do that type of study um, now, when each disability affects each child differently. At our disabilities conference we have on October 3rd uh, up in East Rutherford, we are uh, looking at autism as one of the particular areas of interest because a lot of parents are very interested in that. Do you find that those parents of autistic kids are more aggressive in seeking treatment for their children than people whose kids have other disabilities, audio, um, visual. I think that the autism lobby is, is a very strong group. Um, and I think that those parents have banded together very, very well and really pushed for the research to be done. And I think that um, there's been a lot more focus on autism over the last decade, without a doubt. And I do think uh, many other um, disabling categories, uh, disabling conditions have not been focused on as much. And, and I think it is because perhaps the, the, the parents and the folks who have been diagnosed with, with those conditions have not banded together. I was talking at one time to a group of students at um, Gaudet, the College for the Deaf, mm -hmm. and the students did not want transplants. They did not want any types of changes. They wanted to continue to use sign language because they had created, in a sense, a culture of the deaf using sign language. Do those sorts of attitudes prevent you from dealing? with special education in a broad sense? I don't think so. I don't think that they, they prevent us from dealing with it. Um, I think that that's a huge and very interesting area of discussion, the cochlear implant versus sign language um, debate. And it is true um, that, that there are many um, who, who don't want cochlear implants and, and really want to just focus on, on their sign language and, and their own culture. And I think that's fine. Uh, you know, that if that's, that's a, a choice, it's a personal choice that needs to be made. And I don't think ultimately that affects the special education programming. It's not as if a school district can force a child to go get a cochlear implant. Um, they have to look at the, the needs of the child and what the child is receiving and then uh, adapt the programming accordingly. We have a huge number of veterans who are or continue to be created by the wars that we're in. And are they covered at all by special education, or do you have to work through the Veterans Administration to deal with their needs? They are not. Special education ends at the age of 21. 
Okay. So um, a student can be eligible to re receive special education services anywhere between the ages of 3 and 21. Um, so uh, upon their 22nd birthday or if they turn 21 by a certain date within the year, uh, excuse me, turn 22, um, their, their uh, services will terminate. And so the only situation would be where you have a veteran who comes back from the war who's under 21 who still wants to get special education services. What happens after 21 if I have the disability? Do they go through the Social Security Administration? It's a very good question. Um, we, and it's a big problem. The transition services, I think, that are provided by school districts um, are less than desirable many times. And I think that we do a poor job of preparing young people to transition into adulthood when they have disabling conditions. And uh, what is available for them, it depends. We have the Division of Developmental Disabilities with the state. That is not an entitlement, however. And so if there's no money, they don't have to provide the services. I believe we have a waiting list of something between 6,000 and 8,000 uh, for uh, group home placements for adults with severe developmental delays through uh, the um, DDD. We also have the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. There is SSI um, available, but I think there is a lot to be done to lower the unemployment rates of persons with disabilities to ensure that they graduate to, you know, really prepare them for some success in adulthood. But SSI is uh, supplemental to the Social Security Administration. It really isn't an, ar an array of services. Isn't it's it? not services. No, it's a monetary supplement and and health insurance that but coincides with it. Aren't I covered under the under the federal law past the age of twenty one to deal with services? To, to receive services, receive services yeah. it's a tough it's a tough road to fight I think I th you know there's there's uh, I think that parents have to work a lot as particularly with the severely developmentally delayed to access the services for their children um, upon reaching adulthood uh, and you know certainly there's SSD social security disability but you know there's there's different categories there's different um, Eligibility factors that have to be considered, uh, the medical documentation that has to be provided is is vast yep. in order to yep. become eligible. It's not always easy to obtain. Um, I think lots of times there's a frontline level of denial of services, um, only to grant them later on upon appeal. So so there's a lot that that parents have to contend with with their children, and and young adults have to contend with themselves. One of the points that was made on the shows that we did three shows actually on autism. One of the points was these parents are all worried about a terrible eventuality, that their autistic kids become adults and they're gone. Mm -hmm. And what happens? And they had no answers, so we had no answers. We have no you answers. You had no answers either. It's a very valid concern. Absolutely. And, uh, what happens? I mean, do they, do they just walk around in, in a state of um, denial? Uh, it's, it's kind of... Uh, fascinating. When your colleagues get together at the clinic and you lay out your master plan, your strategic plan, the things that academics love to do, which nobody ever follows, <laughs> anyhow, it's like our plan. Um, what do you say that are your real top priorities? Our top priorities in recent years, there have been a couple. The first is um, shifting focus to the younger age population and really looking at um, the early intervention group ages zero to three and why are we not identifying disabilities earlier and providing services to address and in some ways treat those disabilities earlier because all the research has shown that for every dollar spent for the zero to three age population you save four to seven dollars later on um, in, in uh, services that are reduced that children no longer need. So I think um, we have a lot of work to do on ensuring that the early intervention program in the state is accessed more and providing more services. I think the same goes for the preschool age population, three to five. We need to target early and, and treat early rather than giving these Band-Aid approaches later on. Do you have training sessions for the first line, it seems to me, doctors. Do you train doctors? Do you talk to doctors about the rights if they see a kid who obviously has 
a special ed need, what the doctor should do? We have had some training with doctors, and actually we are in the process of developing a medical legal partnership between our clinic and University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey's Department of Pediatrics, specifically for that purpose, to better educate them on some of the frontline questions that they should be asking and issues that they, you know, should be uh, addressing, and then pri providing backup legal services to them and, and uh, to, excuse me, not to the doctors, but to the, the families and the children to get the services for them. How about communities of faith? Are they of any? They used to be the people that took care of people. Do you see that anymore? Do you see that the... Some. I mean, we still the, see some of the larger the, groups uh, providing assistance, but not as much. Again, I think um, the economic climate has really hurt um, that the ability to get the services through those institutions and organizations. What would you tell us in terms of special education about um, what we should do to help if we can help? Or have you become so specialized in the law that really there's not, there's not any room for lay people? I think there's always room for <coughs> lay people. The way the law is constructed is that lay people actually can serve as advocates on behalf of parents who can't afford advocates um, in special education cases. And so they, you know, to the extent they're willing to volunteer through, and there's different programs. There's the surrogate parent programs that each school district has to operate. There's the CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocate programs for uh, children in foster care where um, any adult can get some training in special education and actually help to advocate and, and help serve as a voice for parents who are often have not just the special education issues that they're facing for their children, but numerous other issues that they're facing. If I have, in my family, I see a, a kid who's obviously, uh, what I think has got either autism or Asperger's syndrome, a milder form, and the parents don't seem to want, don't understand it, don't want to admit it. What can I do if I'm outside of the loop? If you're outside of the loop, it's hard. Um, other than providing information to the parents um, they don't want and to hear encouraging it. They don't, they don't want them, their kids to be labeled as autistic. Unless a you know it, the IDEA is a parent-driven statute, and so while parent itself is defined broadly, unless you are the caregiver of that child or you've been appointed in some capacity to serve as the child's parent for special education purposes, there's little that you can do other than to you know encourage the parents themselves to try to get the assistance. And school districts should be identifying these children as well. They have an affirmative obligation to do so. But but, but if I if I know that a parent is sexually abusing their child, I have recourse. I can go to the police. The police will deal with the issue. Why, why, why is it that I have any recourse if I see an autistic kid being allowed to just fall by the wayside because his parents don't want to admit that he's had autism? Well, um, in the child welfare system, there are, one could make a claim of educational neglect if one thought that it amounted to that, but that creates a whole slew of other um, systemic involvement in I mean, the child have and to family's deal with the life. Education. Um, and the and, and, and education, and the child welfare system, and yeah. you know that that's that's a road that perhaps is not one that you want to go down. Um, it really would have to amount to severe educational neglect to pursue that. Um, sometimes, honestly, it just takes persistence with parents where they need to hear it over and over again and, and get involved in support groups and be educated about what the issues are and what services are available. And over time, they come to see that, that it could be helpful to get the assistance. Now, do you do any public interest spots on television? We do not, unfortunately. Our budget is very, very limited. We um, uh, Usually, uh, people find out about us from word of mouth um, and But these would the be web. public interest spots that'd be free. Uh, we have not. The school districts, um, oftentimes in the state, do child find um, public interest spots talking about identifying children. We are unable to handle too many cases within our clinic just because of the fact that we are educating law students alongside providing legal representation. Right. So it's, you know, the it's a little bit scary to have the floodgates open. On the flip side, um, we provide trainings all across the state regularly for parent groups, different professionals working with children on special education and early intervention. 
um, and how to best advocate for their children to understand their rights, what the obligations are of school districts and whatnot, and, and we use that as our method for educating the public. I hope you'll be at our at our uh, disabilities conference on October 3rd. I will be there along with some of our law students as well. Very wonderful. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak today to Jennifer um, Valverde. Um, she is at the Rutgers Law School and she, most importantly she's dealing with the special ed clinic. And we've really asked her the basic questions about special education but there's a lot more to come and we would hope that out of this conference that we've really had an opportunity to set up on October 3rd, that we'd be able to look at it now in a broader sense, maybe even a national sense, and to raise the types of issues that we've raised here today. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you.